Uh, good evening. We are here. We are ready to go. My name is John Horn. I'm from the Los Angeles Times. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I am joined by the cast and crew of Flight. Mr. Denzel Washington has taken ill, so will not be able to join us this evening and sends his regrets. Uh, from my left, all the way across, Brian Garrity, Tamara Tooney, John Gatons, Robert Zemeckis, Don Cheadle, John Goodman, Bruce Greenwood, Melissa Leo, and James Badge Dale. Uh, the format, very quickly, we'll do 15 minutes of a moderated Q&A here. We'll take 15 minutes of questions from the five satellite theaters, and we'll have 15 minutes of questions from New York. I want to start with John Gatons. John, uh, this movie started with a, for, what, what was for you a terrifying plane trip, but not in the normal way. Explain what happened on that flight uh, about 12 years ago. Uh, um, okay, so there's obviously two big elements in the movie. There's the, the kind of addiction and recovery and somewhat story, and there's also the flying thing. So the personal way in for me is that, you know, I got, I got sober when I was 25, and that kind of informed this big period of my life that still exists, thankfully. But um, I became a really nervous flyer after I got sober for some reason. And um, I was flying for work a lot, and I was flying back from Germany from, from work, and there was this pilot sat down next to me in his pilot blues, and I'm a pretty friendly guy, and this guy just kept talking to me and I really wanted him to shut up and I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what was annoying me about this guy so much and what I realized was that my vision of my pilot who's flying the plane, who I cede control to whenever I get into an airplane is that he's gonna be this perfect, God-fearing soldier who's gonna take a bullet for me to get me to JFK. And I was like, I don't wanna know that your wife hates you or that you know, you've got big problems or you're circling the drain or you've got some addiction problem, you're an alcoholic and then I had that writer moment of like, what if? Like, what if this guy is that? And then what if I put him in this extraordinary like situation and make him do a heroic piece of flying? And then what would we think of him? So that was kind of the initial germ. And it took a long, it look, it took a long time for that to come together, it's, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, that was 1999. So I mean, I, I wrote the first 40 pages of the script, which are mostly what you see here. And um, you know, it, it's, it took lots of turns and false starts and going back and starting and stopping and picking it up and putting it down. And I always say, like, I had no children when I started writing that movie, and now I have three, and they're, like, big, <laughs> you know? And uh, so the movie was really born out of my two greatest fears, which are drinking myself to death and dying in a plane crash. Uh, Robert, you're a pilot, but I suspect you are not responding to the material as, a, as an aviation buff or as a pilot. You, you come across the script, and I think at this point, Denzel Washington is interested in playing the part. How do you respond to the material, and where does your response to it start? Well, uh, you know, the thing that, the thing that was, uh, yes, I read the screenplay, fell in love with the screenplay. Uh, I thought it was one of the most interesting, complex things I had ever read. Um, all my advisors and my agent and everyone said, oh, Bob, you can't do another movie with a plane crash in it um, because I had done Castaway. But I, I, um, I uh, love the screenplay for all the other reasons. I, I love the, um, um, all the emotional ambiguity of the entire piece, of all the characters, of everything that was in it. And yet it was incredibly uh, dramatic and uh, suspenseful. And I had heard that Denzel was interested in doing it, and when I read the piece, I thought he'd be perfect for it. And so we got together and decided that we'll give it a, give it a go. It's been quite a, quite a while since you've directed uh, a live action movie. You've spent the last decade make, making motion capture movies. Uh, I'm curious if that was good training for this, if you felt like it's riding a bicycle, it's a tra it's, it's a tactics and, and a way of filmmaking that you never forget. And was that something that you were Excited about no longer making motion capture and going back into live action? Well, you know, um, the, you know, making movies is making movies. Uh, uh, certainly, um, um, doing a, a, a motion capture movie is nice because you never have to go out in the cold. You never have to go out at night. You never have to can kind of make it in your house slippers. Uh, so that's very nice. But um, no, I mean, I had no, I had no agenda. This screenplay was uh, was too good to pass up and. Um, and I had done, a, you know, I'd worked with an, an amazing um, roster of actors doing those motion capture movies. So I was actually, I think, in really good shape to uh, to come and direct this magnificent cast. I and and it, and it was it was like riding a bicycle. I, I was no, I had no issue once I got on the set. And the the actors, you were not concerned that you'd be wearing spandex and covered with green dots on your first day on the job. I guess not. I think they were probably relieved. <laughs> 
Uh, this is a movie that's about a lot of choices, about people making difficult choices in difficult situations. I want to talk about Margaret's character for a minute, because we really don't know what happens and what Margaret does. I'm curious as an actor and in that character, if you have a conversation with your screenwriter, with your director, about what happens after that and what that conversation leads you to do after the funeral. Right. You know, I, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I've got a little cold too. I, I um, you know, I, I didn't um, actually talk to, to Bob or John about what happens after. You know, um, when, when, when uh, Whip walks away from her, having asked her to, to lie on his behalf, um, and she says, what do you want me to say? I, 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 for me, I, I think she was still undecided as to what she was going to say, you know? Um, unfortunately, we didn't see her part of the, the testimony, but I think, um, you know, once, uh, I, I think once everybody was on board, everybody was on board, you know, when, when, um, when uh, the Jesus guy just, you know, said, let's just pray, you know, it was praise just like, Jesus. praise Jesus, we're all alive, you know, so, you know, but I mean, but uh, uh, Margaret too was also a very religious person, you know, and so, so I really um, appreciated kind of the moral conflict for her. I mean, not just were they, you know, good friends and colleagues who have worked together for a long time. Um, she also respected him and his talent. He also did save her life, you know, so uh, I, I, I kind of like that, you know, not knowing quite what to do in that situation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go down to Don. Don, a slightly similar situation for your character in terms of what he's willing to do to preserve his client's, uh, I don't know, his client's innocence, his client's life. Yeah, I think anything. I mean, that he is willing to do that. I mean, is that something he comes to learn, or, or does he believe that from the beginning of the movie? Uh, I felt uh, pretty clearly from the onset that he had a very defensible position. I mean, in fact, there's a lot of question uh, as to whether or not his ability to do what he did, Whip's ability as a pilot to do what he did, was predicated on the fact that he was intuitive and that he was in an altered state where he wasn't just going by the book, where he threw the manual out the window and went, okay, I'm high and I'm on you know, alcohol, let me just flip this thing over and like, make it happen. Right. You know, I don't know that you do that like you do. in a sober state. And uh, that's an argument that can be made. And, and, uh, and, and the, the question of, you know, quote unquote, throwing his, his friend under the bus at the end, I always really felt like, were she to have the ability to speak from the grave, she would probably say, take the pass. Hmm. I did have a, my, my alcohol, I, I, I did have a, a my, my um, sorry, my tox report did come back as being drunk. I did, and I did have these uh, issues in my past. I don't want you to throw your life away. I mean, I'm imagining this conversation where he to speak to his dead friend, who was his lover as well. I don't want you to spend the rest of your life in jail. To what end? You know, save yourself, get out, go ahead, say I drank it. What's the, what's the harm? Mm -hmm. John Goodman, where would you put Harlane's moral compass? What direction does it point? <laughs> it's rapidly spinning in all directions. <laughs> Not unlike Harling himself. <laughs> and? His moral compass is, uh, is, is his loyalty to his friend Whip. Uh, and there's a lot of hero worship involved there. It's also uh, in his mind being on TV uh, as, as the hero's friend. Uh, but he, he just, he lives a life of immediate gratification. So he, he just wants to ease things for his pal. We haven't talked much about, about media in this film and what it has to say about hero and how we identify heroes. I don't know, John, any of the actors, if you want to jump in on this. Um, Robert, it, it, was that something you were very specifically interested in at the, at the outset about the different side to a hero and, and where we don't really get the full picture of who these people might be? Yeah, I, it, it was interesting. Yeah, it, because everything, it, it seems that you know, the media is very quick to jump on on something um, and not obviously get the whole story, but you know, just sort of a lot of times put out the story that everybody wants to hear, and that was always in the screenplay. That I mean, that was that was like one more layer of misery that was layered on to Whip. I thought because you know he had to carry around the fact that you know he is a complete you know screw up, and you know, and everyone in the world is calling him a hero. On top of all his other problems, he's got that one as well. 
Uh, the movie also has a lot to say about faith and about uh, beliefs. I mean, God is my co-pilot here. Um, I mean, it, it, and it doesn't feel as in it's inauthentic. And I don't know if John, if that's something you 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 wrote from or something yeah, you gave I mean, the I, actors. I think to that do? you know, I, I heard the expression many years ago that there are um, there's no atheists in a foxhole, and my experience is that there's no atheists in a plane at thirty thousand feet that's pitching all over the place. You know, like I'm constantly searching for God that I'm not sure I understand at that moment where I'm like, oh, please, God. I'm like, who is God? Well, I don't know, but hopefully he'll stop this plane from shaking. <laughs> and, you know, so for me, I just felt like, you know, that's why, like, Badge's character, the gaunt young man for me was, like, so interesting. And Bob and I immediately connected on that character because, you know, he kind of brings us the whole theme of the movie in a really fractured, funny, kind of beautiful, elegant way. He introduces our two kind of broken characters together, but he kind of talks about God and his own kind of, you know, concept of it because he's near this other side. And I think that when people go through dramatic events, whether it's losing someone in a plane crash or being in a plane crash or having someone sick in your life, it's, you start reaching for all these tools and the big one in the bag is usually like, what do I believe? What's on the other side? The thing I loved about the screenplay was that this concept of act of God yeah. is only brought up by the lawyer. Right. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, 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 as, and, I started, and as I started thinking about that, you know, when you start to think about this idea of airplanes falling out of the sky, we don't have like legalese you know, uh, di uh, words to, to describe that stuff. We, we have to speak of it in these sort of uh, terms of, uh, of spirituality because that's what, you know, that's what that kind of thing is. Right. I want to get Badge into the conversation. Gaunt man down at the end. I mean, that's a, uh, yes. you, have, you have that, that really pivotal scene in, in the stairwell. Uh, uh, tell me a little bit about, about that scene and what, how it worked. Um, well, it's, it's, it's interesting spending an entire day in a stairwell with Kelly Riley and Denzel. I mean, it's a small space. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the question of, of God and faith, though, I mean, I, I really enjoyed, first of all, the writing is so well, and how many times are you going to get to say God in the F word in so many, in the same sentence <laughs> so many times, but I mean, the, the, I kind of wanted to take this irreverent take on it and then just throw it up against the wall um, and wanted to have him come from a place of having lived and and it's it's an interesting thing I, I if if I do want to get in the world of sharing background I feel like this this kid was a kid who really did believe in God at some point and then went through a life and it's an interesting thing to watch people who were very devoutly religious, fell off that, and then come to another place where it's, it all comes together somehow in some different kind of understanding, which I, I personally don't have that type of understanding, but I like, I like reading other people's words who do. <laughs> Brian? Yeah, I think um, I, I was exactly, I, ha I had spirituality uh, completely when I started the flight, and uh, that's why I'm able to look past it and say, you know, this is, this is okay, even though I know what you did. And that was a choice we made that uh, I was conflicted, you know? Bob, I want to talk a little bit about casting. We haven't gotten to, to Bruce. Uh, and who else is down there? I can barely see you, <laughs> Melissa. Melissa. Well, uh, 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 great performances. Um, I'm curious about, and, and, and Melissa and Bruce, please uh, talk about meeting with Robert and coming into this movie and what you were looking for from him in terms of your interest in being in the film. Um, well, I just, I, I heard that there was a, a day that uh, Bob Zemeckis might need me and I'd get to work with Denzel Washington and I said, okay, sure. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the preparation was, was largely with the team that um, Mr. Zemeckis had hired, the costumes and makeup. The, she very sneakily got me into that perfect little red jacket. Um, and and you know felt very included although I you know there was no rehearsal time or sitting and talking that I remember um, a little bit of talking there on the on the set a little bit the weekend I arrived in Atlanta we did um, spend some time together and talked and I didn't know if he w wanted me to be angry with Whip or chastising Whip or treat him like I was his mother or you know what 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 did he how did he see it landing himself and. Bob just said very simply he wanted me to extract the truth from Whip and that Ellen just wanted the truth. So uh, that's what I, I tried to do for him. And Bruce? I, it's very few, not very often you read a script that's kind of actor proof. 
you know, and, and I read this and I thought this is virtually every word in it feels real enough that you, John had done so much homework for us in terms of the vernacular, the different cadences of the different characters, that um, after it was, a, it was a, what, 150 pages long or something? And I thought, it's how? Took forever to read, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's just one of those things where you go, well, there's, this is never going to end up as, uh, never going to end up in the movie, all this stuff, but somehow yeah. it did because the, it just unfolds in such a compelling way. So um, I read it and then campaigned to get it. Good. I'm going to go to the social media questions from our five satellite screenings. The first one's for Bob. Uh, were there any new techniques, CGI, camera lenses that you used in shooting, especially the crash sequence? Uh, uh, no, it's pretty much uh, um, off, you know, standard uh, CGI stuff that we, you know, tools that we have now. Although this is the first movie that I shot with um, a digital camera, the red, the red camera, and I loved it. And um, you know, it's just it's just a great tool. How does shooting motion capture, where you can put the camera anywhere and you can pre-visualize everything, prepare you for a movie like this? Well, you know, it, uh, it doesn't prepare you for it. I mean, what, it, well, I, well, I guess what happened is that when you're doing a motion capture movie and you, can, and you can put the camera absolutely anywhere, you have to think really hard about where exactly that camera's gonna go. And um, so you go through a lot of uh, those paces. And what I, what I realized in the motion capture movies is I always just went with my instinct. And I brought that to this movie. So I would just say, okay, there's where the camera's gonna go. And uh, that's... Yeah, but basically, when I ever, when, I always, I always stage the movie based on the screenplay. The screenplay is what tells me where the camera goes. Do you, do you have John? Uh, do you actually have camera locations, or it's just you no, just? No, of course he doesn't. Of course okay. he doesn't. No, 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 no. I meant the, all. Little notes in there, Bob. <laughs> yeah. Close up here, Dear Bob. Another uh, next question is also for Bob. How did you shoot the transition shot from Denzel's face from the hearing to the prison? Yeah, well, that's a that's a, a, a digital morph, and um, you know, you, you we lay out the shot uh, on one side, and then we, I mean, it's very complicated geometry. It was done on an arm with a remote head, and you know, we had a laser pointer and um, an arcing grid that we we um, copied and laid on the floor in front of Denzel, so that the camera operators could follow the laser pointer around had a stopwatch on it so that we timed the, the camera move to be exactly the same speed as close as we could. But the beauty of the digital cinema is you can, you can cobble that stuff together really well, uh, even if it's imperfect. A uh, question for, from Sherman Oaks for Melissa. Melissa, did you understand all the technicalities that you were discussing? <laughs> Not in the least. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that, that, yeah, you learn how to pronounce them? What do you do? basically learn how to pronounce them. I, I did, I mean, some basic understanding of, of, of sort of what's happening. I mean, the script was helpful in that way. Um, and, you know, I, I felt that I understood what I was saying. Could I repeat it now? I don't know. Absolutely not. No idea about it. But it did make some sense at the time. And it wasn't really the, the heart of what Ellen's argument was, in fact, going to be. It was some technical thing she had to go through. It was very, very hard language to learn. I, I, I will say that. Uh, question from Pasadena for Tamara. Uh, do you think this changed the way you think about flight attendants and their and air travel and crew responsibilities? <laughs> you know, it, I, when I get on the plane, I always poke my head into the cabin now and take a big sniff just to make sure everybody's cool. Just kidding. Just kidding. But, you know, we trained with, um, with real flight attendants, and so uh, we did like a little crash course on being a flight attendant and stuff. So to speak. So, no pun intended, exactly. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, you know, it was really great to train with them. And ironically, uh, my husband and I took a trip earlier this year um, on the airline uh, who we actually trained with and um, some of them were actually fans of mine and so so you know they treat, treated us really well and then uh, I told him I said I you know I trained with your your company for the movie the Denzel movie and they were like great did you did you do the announcements and stuff and I was like oh yes oh yes you know ladies and gentlemen the captain has turned on the fast and seatbelt sign blah blah and they were like come here come here come here so as we were landing they gave me the microphone and so I, I brought the plane in. It was great. That's one place where we probably will not be seeing flight, is an uh, in-flight movie. Um, a, question from, a question from Pasadena for Mr. Goodman. Uh, is being a comic actor instinctual, and did you find it challenging to be funny in this kind of dark subject matter? 
No and no. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is from the Beach Cities for Don Cheadle. Knowing that your character was there to save Whip, why did Whip still act so coldly to Hugh? And what did you guys talk about in, that, in those conversations? Um, well, I think it may also be something that, that uh, Bob was talking about earlier, where another uh, needle for Whip is that he's being called a hero. Uh, I think somewhere inside of his character, he knows that he really does, quote unquote, deserve uh, to to face the fire, whatever that is, and, and, and be held accountable, and that, you know, Hugh is doing everything in his power to, to keep him from that sort of accountability. So I think you can often hate, when you're in that sort of struggle, I think you hate the people that are they're trying to save you. You're saying, what do you, you know, get off, I'm not the person to, to save, get away from me, you know. I can see that, that struggle in him. A uh, question from Hollywood for Bruce Greenwood. I don't know if this is from your mother, but the question is, do you think being exceptional excuses certain behavior, or is that just an excuse? <laughs> <laughs> they must know you very well. Um, I think that's one of the, maybe that's one of the points the movie's driving home, is that regardless of what you, if you do something spectacular and, and heroic, if it's, if it's sourced, if it's, if it's source is something that's, that's an infirmity, a liability of yours, something that's, that's, I don't know, what's the, what's the word? It's too bad this thing is being filmed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, if it's bad. If, if you have a monkey on your back, like, like Whip does, and in spite of that monkey, you manage to do something spectacular, and like Don says, if, that was, if some small part of that made you capable of doing it, does that let you off the hook? Well, I, no, I don't think it does. I mean... So I guess the answer should have been just no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, question, uh, a question for John Gatons. Um, knowing that what was shot was really the first, more or less the first 40 pages of your original script, where did the idea of inverting the plane come from? Well, you know, NTSB reports are public records, so you can pour through um, recaps and what they find through all of these investigations and hearings that they have. Um, and I did that, and I looked at a lot of different incidents, a lot of different planes, and then I spoke to a pilot who's a friend of our family's, and I said, I'm trying to write this story about an alcoholic commercial airline pilot, and he paused and said, yeah, I knew a guy. And I was like, oh, I, was like I don't want to talk about that. And he was like, yeah, you know, when we fly planes, we get the tail number and everything, and we go, oh, it's Bouncy Betty, or it's, and I said, you have names for the planes? I said, wait, stop, I don't want to have that conversation. I said, I'm just trying, and he said, well, what are you thinking of? And I discussed one incident, this United flight from, uh, from 1989, and I, I said, well, that one was interesting to me. There was a lot of conversation in the cockpit, and there was some heroic things that were done, and he said, you know, look at this Alaska. Um, 261. So I, I looked at a bunch of different incidents, and that one is incredibly fascinating. And they did actually achieve inverted flight for about a minute. And there's conversation in the cockpit while it went on. So I kind of cobbled together from a, um, from a, what a pilot suggested for me. Right. For me. This is a crash off the coast of California. How long ago? Where the tail? It was 2001, I believe. There was a, a similar mechanical malfunction. Sim what similar mechanical in the malfunction. Um, a question from Sherman Oaks for Bob. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about the technical aspects of staging the plane crash? Well, um, well, we had a, um, we had a, 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 a obviously we had a mock-up set of the uh, of the of the cabin, and we had a separate um, set of the cockpit, um, and um, and uh, the uh, cockpit was put on a, uh, a a a motion base that is sort of like an emotion a motion base like a, from an amusement park ride, right. so it could do all these different things, and then we had a second cockpit that was a one that could be completely inverted. And then the plane cabin was designed um, to be on vibrators and shakers. And then uh, when we were then moving the camera into the cockpit to shoot that, we would put that uh, cabin on a gimbal that would be able to turn it completely upside down. That's, uh, is that technical enough? That's very technical. And uh, the Thank next you. question, fortunately, is for Brian. What was it like filming the cr uh, crash sequence, and how did oh, you prepare yeah. for it? That was uh, completely in, uh, scary, intense, and um, having the the motion cockpit and uh, Denzel next to you was frightening enough. And <laughs> the small space, it was uh, it was actually very easy. You know, um, we went down to Delta and trained with a few of the pilots down there, and they they had us flying the. Um, the, with the simulator. the simulator and taking off and that and uh, that was really difficult and learning all the technical language and speaking to the um, 
air traffic control is like near impossible, I'd say, just to get the, the cadence right and the quickness of it. But uh, fortunately, I didn't have to learn how to land the plane. Just put in a just lot take of hours. Do you remember how many hours you put in? You put in a lot. I pro probably put in about 14 hours. Yeah. 14, yeah. He's yeah. got 14 hours. You put it in your logbook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good training. Yeah. But you told me you'd know if I was faking it, so. <laughs> Uh, Tamara, I think a similar question, the, the uh, black, uh, from Pasadena question, the, the filming the cockpit, the black box scene. Yeah, it was, uh, it was so cool. I mean, it was really yeah. cool. Um, you know, I'm in the cockpit with Brian and Denzel, and, and uh, you know, it's a very close and intimate uh, space, and, and, and the way that thing was rocking and rolling, okay. you know, I really didn't have to do mu that much acting, because it really was pretty terrifying, and, you know, all I had to do really was to pretend that I was seeing what was going to be, you know, added in front of us later. And, um, and it, you know, it was, an, I mean, I went home with, you know, real bruises and, you know, real, I mean, it was fantastic. And I was like, I'm in an action movie. This is great. You know, so it was we really were, awesome. We were actually hung upside down. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we were really That was the best down. part. We called it the rotisserie. You put on so your seatbelt. Yeah. Mm -hmm, so when it, uh, when the, when the plane turned upside down, well, my hair, you could see, I was hanging upside down. So it, it was, it was just really cool. We're going to take a couple more social media questions. If there are people in this theater who want to have questions, now would be the time to queue up at the microphone. Uh, question from San Francisco for Don Cheadle. Uh, what was it like working with Denzel again? I was you know, kind of right back at it, you know, right back on the horse. Um, it's funny that I, you know, 17 years ago, I think, when we did Devil, uh, that I was sort of brought on to play this character, Mouse, who is his protector and the guy that have his back. And, in a strange and similar way, this is who I uh, portray again in this film, somebody who's there to, uh, to, to protect him. Uh, though in this film, he doesn't really want the protection. So it was, it was a kind of interesting twist, but you know, we kind of just fall right back into it. I've kept in touch with him over the years. A question from the Beast Cities for Melissa Leo. What attracts you to playing such strong female characters? I guess, as opposed to strong male characters. <laughs> well, I'd be happy to play the strong male characters as well if they offered them to me. And mostly I play the characters that they offer to me. And if they come out strong, maybe that is my opinion about women in general. Uh, I have a question, uh, question for Bob. How difficult is it to make a movie like this in modern Hollywood? It's an adult drama with a lot of ambiguity. I'm curious. You from, mean how difficult it is to get green lit? Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Um, it's very hard. It's very hard, and um, you know the only—I mean the um, the way that we had to ultimately do it was um, we had to make it in a, as inexpensively as we could. Um, so our our production budget was actually thirty million dollars, and and Denzel and I waived our fees, um, and that's how you have to make a movie that's uh, an, a, you know a, a, an adult drama, and um, that's just the way of the world. I'm just curious from everybody up here, is, that, is it depressing that that is the way of the world or exciting that you get to make a movie like this or is both true at the same time? Uh, I look for me, forward to waiving fees, don't you, Don? <laughs> yeah, making movies? Yeah, waiving fees. Yeah, yeah. waiving fees is fun. Yeah, real fun. Um, <clears throat> but you know, it's like we're kind of spoiled because I think, you know, I'm, I'm 47 years old and I came up during a time of really the golden age of, of American cinema, you know. And uh, it's hard to get those kinds of, I mean, I don't know if Dog Day Afternoon would be made, you know, today. Kramer versus, Kramer versus Kramer would be made today. There's a lot of films that, for me, were sort of, you know, the bellwether of what it's supposed to be, and you just don't, they just wouldn't get made nowadays. They wouldn't come out of the studio system. John? Yeah, no, I, I mean, as the writer, I have to ask, what are fees? <laughs> um, That's right, you don't know what those are. keep kicking that word around. Anyway, um, no, uh, I think that, you know, in the 10 years that I attempted to try to get the movie made, you know, um, luckily there was a moment in time, there was a writer strike which really killed the movie at one point, and then, but there was a turn back towards, you know, a, adult movie. I mean, like, adult grown-up dramas. That didn't come out right. Um, <laughs> let me try that again. Um, you know what I'm saying. I mean, it's I like there, there, was, there was movies that actually showed that an audience will come and see a movie that's, that's built for them. You know, that's more of a mature audience. Yeah, but of course they'll always... Can you always, say it better, yes. John? I, I, no, I know. I know exactly what you're saying. Uh, last question from the social media crowd from the West Coast. Uh, Bob uh, Zemeckis, do you feel like you expanded on the relationship of whip and knuckles? 
I expand it. Uh, well, I, th I think it was appropriate. What we had there was, uh, was appropriate. I think, you get you, I think you get it. I think uh, the uh, two scenes with Denzel and his son um, are just these perfect grace notes in the, in the, um, in the, um, in the movie. And um, I particularly think the ending is the perfect ending uh, for the film. Were there alternate endings? And did you play around? There right? was discussion of alternate <laughs> endings. John's nodding, John. No, I mean, we, you know, there was lots of things that went on in those 10 years. And, you know, um, there was a version, remember, we, where we, Nicole didn't survive the movie. There was yeah, that moment. Yeah, there was a moment where we thought maybe she wasn't going to make right. it, you know. Um, and there was moments also where she was, we kind of reveal her at the end, like in her car outside of the prison, somehow having intertwined her to having brought his son to see him. And it was too hard to pull that off and just didn't feel real. And, you did know, you Bob ever have an decision. ending in which Ellen and Whip ended up together? <laughs> we did. We did. And what's right, funny about that is that was, I, yeah, well, I, I, I was, was talking adult about adult movie movies well, before. I know, but yeah. I think it's interesting, though. I think it's interesting that Whip and Nicole are both not here, and we're here. Yeah, yeah we can yeah. talk about them. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, we uh, can, we're going to move yeah. to audience questions now. Again, I'm going to repeat my, uh, my warning. Make them quick, no speeches, and uh, go ahead and start us off. Yeah, hi. My question is for Mr. Goodman. You obviously bring a lot of humor into an otherwise serious drama. Can you describe the collaboration with Bob in deciding how comedic to make that role, if at all you had that collaboration? I don't think that. It was, it was, everything was pretty much on the page. There was no intent to try to be funny. Yeah, but, but, yeah, okay, well, but, but John has is, is got impeccable comedy timing, and he was able to just do it and make every single moment really, 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 really funny. Really, really funny. Uh, I'm curious, Bob, when you, when you read John's script, when you read that character, do you say, this has to be Goodman, or did you actually identify actors you want in certain roles? Uh, n no, I think you know it's a process. It's a process. I think um, it's an it's more of an elimination process in the in, in the office. It just kind of goes. You you you, you people that names are thrown at you, and you go no 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 no, um, um, and then and then you start putting together and it's a very short list of the people. And uh, you know, look, John was at the top of the list from from the for very first moment. I have a question. Was the CeeLo an ad lib or? That was, that was, that, that was, a, that, that was, was an ad lib. I love that. That was an ad lib. That was an ad lib. That was an ad lib. Next question, please go ahead, step up. Thanks. Hi. Um, any actor who feels the questions relevant can answer. Do you feel that your character really embraces theology out of faith or as a coping mechanism in the face of tragedy? Who wants to take that? Good I'll question. Start. Margaret's very much a church going lady, you know. Um, as as Whip says, the church of rock and roll, let's get it on down at was it, you know, oh, yeah. Jesus Christ, <laughs> Jesus Christ superstar. Um, but yeah, Margaret is 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 a very religious person, you know. And it's so interesting because you know, if you live in the South or live in Atlanta, I mean pretty much everybody goes to church, you know. And to what degree you actually practice that in your real life is, you know, up to you. But um but Margaret very much was um, um, was very religious and you know during the crash still even though she was steeped in faith she was still terrified you know and calling on Jesus so yeah. anybody else want to take that Bob has somebody in mind badge oh. no. <laughs> really didn't think that was coming to me <laughs> The most important thing in that moment, and, and in my experiences of watching people die, is that they become more present. The closer they come to that moment, the more present they are, the more connected they are to the people in the room with them. Now, whether they're talking about God in that moment, I don't know, but what I noticed through my experience in this, it, it wasn't until last night when I was watching the film for the first time that I realized how much we actually did talk about God in that scene. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, next question, go ahead. Tomorrow and Brian, you already answered this, so for the rest of the cast, is there, in portraying your characters, is there any specific research that you pulled from? You guys hear the question? Is there any specific research that any of you did to prepare for this role? Uh, not really. Again, I, I feel like a lot of it was in the, you know, the script is, is really the Bible, and it, it was kind of all there. I mean, there was cursory things that I did that, you know, that I looked up and, and did research, not about specific you know, a criminal defense attorney on a, on a case like this, but, you know, 
not really. I mean, I think most of it was, was really there. You, we discussed you, you came, it. We had a conversation yeah. about blood alcohol content and you know, how those laws differ between countries, and it was really fascinating. Yeah, there's, there's things that, that fold in when you flesh it all out, but you know, it was mostly taking the inspiration from, from the script and, and from Robert's direction and, and the cast. John Goodman, you want to talk about your research? Or not here? I, I, the script was so well, well written that uh, I really didn't... I just had to rely on that. Uh, next question, go ahead. My question is for uh, Bob, I mean, Robert. Um, this was a lot darker film than I was like really expecting. A lot, what I was expecting from you. Like, did that initially scare you when you you know read it? Because all the films that I've seen from you have been like you know something that you could take the family to. And this I don't think was necessarily that film. No, I mean that didn't scare me. There were a lot of other things that scared me. Um, I, 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 no, I mean it was it, it, you know. It, it was all there. It was, I mean, the, 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 the um, you know, at the end of the day, I never, I, I, at the end of this film, I, I saw this film as a very hopeful film. It's one, you know, I always felt that it was, you know, if you're still breathing, you know, you've got a chance. Yeah. Um, and, um, but, you know, to get to that, to get to that light place, you have to start in the dark place. I mean, that's what, and that's, so, it was always there on the on the page, and there was. And this is the movie that um, you know I signed on to do, and I want and I and I you know and I had to be true to the to the screenplay the way it was written. What were the things that scared you? Well, it wasn't scary. It's, well, first of all, I mean, it's it flies in it, all the things all the things that attracted me to the script are the things that terrified me. It flies in the face of convention to put the giant action scene at the beginning of the movie. Mm -hmm. um, but the great spectacle that follows after are all these performances and Denzel's performance, obviously, and everyone here, too. Um, so that actually turned out to, to work out great. The other thing is the scene that, um, Den, you know, that we did with James and, and, and Denzel and, and Kelly, because that's all, you know, when I got to that scene on page 40, uh, when I read the script the first time, it was, I went, wow, you know, this is great, but can we do this? I mean, can you do this in a modern movie? Can you, you know, can you, you basically just have three people standing on marks talking about all this esoteric, esoteric stuff? And, uh, but I love the scene so much and we had to go, we, you know, we just had to go for it. Uh, next question, go ahead. This goes out to John Gattins. Uh, the film, uh, the screenplay took 10 years to write. What was the hardest part about writing it? And for Bob, what was the hardest thing about taking the screenplay and bringing it to the screen? You know, I, I keep talking about the first 40 pages because they never, they're pretty much as they are. And then I never really, I had many different ways to go. And at one point it turned into like this, they met in, in, in rehab and had a love story. And I wrote a whole movie and it didn't work. And it's like I had to throw it out and start over. So there was a lot of stopping and starting. And I was also really nervous. And when Bob actually came on and there was this 2007 draft that we all reference and Denzel always carried around with him. And we would talk about and refer because that was really the basis of where we ended. But Bob said to me, look, you have very commercial instincts as a writer. He's like, you know, which are great. He's like, but forget that for now and trust the instinct where you started and tell this character's story. Because I had scenes and I kept saying to him, look, I want to show you these other things I wrote. There's great scenes between what would have been Melissa Leo and Don Cheadle where it's like they're having these great political, interesting kind of moral arguments about what he did and did he earn it and everything else. And Bob kept saying, that's not in Whip's purview. It's like, you have to stay in his point of view. And I was like, I just kept thinking like, oh no, it has to be a genre movie. It has to be, I guess it needs to be a courtroom thriller or it has to be, and he kept saying, no, point of view, point of view. So I, I totally looked to Bob because I didn't think you could really make a movie like that. Bob, do you want to add to that? Uh, well, I, yeah, I, 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 it was there. I mean, John, John, I mean, John had it there on the page, and it, you know, I mean, there was one little sleight of hand scene that we did, and that's the scene where, where it's Don's scene with the owner of the airline, which was crucial to understand um, everything that was going to happen on this tax report, and it would have been the only time in the movie that the movie would have changed point of view. So, came up with this really clever device of so just having Whip, and Whip couldn't be there, obviously, because they were we put him outside, uh, it became mechanical, we put him outside the window, so it didn't really feel that much like the movie changed point of view at that time, at that point, and it had to. 
Um, but to answer the gentleman's question, uh, you know, listen, I was the hardest thing from for bringing the, the hardest thing for me was I was concerned about the very tight schedule, having very little money, because it was such um, delicate material, and and I was worried about whether you could, if I didn't have enough time, was I going to be able to do it? But I had such a great cast. I mean, everybody, nobody missed a beat. Everybody, everybody, you know, stepped up to the line, and we really just. They just were, they just were there, um, and their choices were all perfect. Next question, go ahead. Uh, question from Mr. Zemeckis. Uh, having two films with a plane crash set piece, were you conscious at all to try and not emulate anything that you had done in Castaway when you started conceiving this scene? No, I took, I did everything, I, I did, I did everything and more. Um, uh, no, I, I, I uh, you know, it was funny because, I, I don't know if I said this already, but, uh, you know, my, my, my partners and my advisors, they all said, Bob, can you do it? You can't do another movie with a, with a plane crash in it. You're going to be known as the plane crash guy. And I said, yeah, but I got to do this movie even if it has a plane crash in it. So, my, so I guess it actually... Because I had done one, which I thought was pretty good, I guess it just sort of fired me up to see if I could do one that was as good or maybe even better. Well, you got FedEx on, on that movie. You couldn't get an airline to come on board this one? No, no, no. no. None, of them, <laughs> none of them would. Uh, none, of, none, of them, none of them needed. They didn't need any of the, any of the, any of the advertising. <laughs> uh, next question over here. Please go ahead. Hi, my question has to do with funding. $30 million to you is minor to a lot of us is exorbitant. So how do you start putting those, to, getting those numbers together and getting all that, you know, getting a studio on board and yet still have the script that you embraced so much and wanted to bring to, to life for all of us? Well, the screenplay was developed in the, in the, in the studio system. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and to, to their credit, I mean, the, the folks at Paramount Pictures, and sincerely, they were very, very courageous in making this movie, even at $30 million. And they really wanted to make it. I mean, they really, really did. And it was, and, and they let us make our movie. And they absolutely let us make our movie. Um, but no, I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, we're in the fortunate place where Paramount funded the movie. Right, but what does that mean in terms of logistics? You have how many days to shoot this versus a big movie, and you 40, go forty-five days. Okay, and then you go to where to shoot it to get a rebate. And we have we go we have to go to we have to go to Georgia to get a rebate. Um, and um, but the but Atlanta was the perfect setting for the movie, so that wasn't really a compromise. Um, it was a perfect city to set the movie in. Uh, next question. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sure you get asked this question a lot. Uh, maybe I'll be the first to answer it this time. Uh, what did you cut out of the movie that was your favorite scene, or what was a great scene that didn't make the final cut or didn't? We didn't the story? cut it. We didn't lift any scenes. We just shortened them. Every, I mean, every I, there's there every there's no lifts. Wow, that's good. No, there's not one. <laughs> that's, and is that generally the case, or just on this? No, no. Generally, it's not the. It's generally not the case. It's very very seldom does that happen. But that just speaks to how how well the screenplay was written. Next question. Go ahead. Sure, thank you. Um, a lot of us in this room and watching uh, the various feeds have been involved in the industry in one way or another and involved in casting. Now, Denzel Washington, I think, many of us regard as maybe the handsomest leading man of his generation, but he doesn't usually get the girl. <laughs> I mean, I can think back to The Mighty Quinn and I'd have a hard time thinking about other movies where Denzel ends up going home with the girl. Um, do you have a sense that that's an unusual aspect of what is otherwise a, a challenging Hollywood film? And uh, were you conscious of it while you're creating this relationship between Denzel and Cole? Who wants to take that? I think Denzel should answer that. <laughs> Uh, no, I think they're I mean, talking I about mean, it right uh, now. Well, no, I, I mean, uh, I mean, in the screen, we knew, uh, we knew. Well, my point of view was that Nicole was going to never be in this relationship. That she knew that if she was in this relationship, she would die. That she, <clears throat> she, and she knew that she. And she says it in the movie. She says, "I, I don't have. I'm not going to come back if I use again." And she knew that she couldn't be in another one of these crazy codependent relationships. And she had the strength to, 
to leave him, but was for her own survival. And that was always in the screenplay, and I knew that was always going to. I mean, we have that little, we have that little thing at, at the end, and where uh, obviously they correspond, and she's helping to celebrate his sobriety. There's a photograph of her at his first uh, anniversary sobriety celebration. So I think she stays in his life. But my feeling was was that it, you know she was going to be very cautious about being so I, I looked at that relationship from her point of view it's a short way of answering the question we have uh, time for two more quick questions so go ahead and step up um, you've, we've talked a little bit about the length of the actual uh, screenplay and that you've been writing it for 10 years the initial 40 were written in how long and i um, wondering what do you think it was about the film that um, kept you focused on it over a 10 year it's okay. Um, so I, I wrote and directed a movie called Dreamer with Dakota Fanning and Kurt Russell, and that came out in 2005. And after I finished that, I still had this 40 pages, which I'd written through those years prior from 2000 up to then. So the studio said to me, we love this movie. We loved working with you. You brought the movie in on time, under budget. What else would you like to do? And they showed me some stuff they were developing, a big comedy, this or that. And I was like, I don't really want to do that. I want to do this. And I showed them those 40 pages. And they were like, well, we, they, we can't do that. <laughs> you know. So I was like, OK. And then they said, we'll make a small deal with you to finish writing that script. And then I took another 18 months to get through it. And then it was 2007, and I had that draft. So I don't remember what the real question was, but Your it was person, a What kept script. you going? What kept you going? Why what did kept you me going? You know what it was? I kept saying to my wife, hey, I got offered to direct this movie. And she kept saying, so, and I would say, well, should I go? I'm going to go and do that. And she was like, no, why would you do that? You're not going to like airlift out of the life of, you know, our family to go do that when you have this. And I was like, oh, but I can't get that done. You know, it was like one of those ongoing things, push pull. It kind of was the, it's the framework of my life, oddly, and it's also kind of the framework of my career, this movie. Wow. Uh, last question. I hope it's a good one. <laughs> Pressure's on. I hope so. Uh, this uh, question uh, for Ellen for the uh, inquiry, when the inquiry was being done, I got a sense as an audience member that somehow the fix was in for this guy to answer the right question, then he'll be off the hook. Hmm. And what would have happened if he did uh, also, if Ellen wants to answer that? Well, let's go ahead. Well, I'm just an actor. I'm not really <laughs> with the National Transportation Safety Board. <clears throat> However... <laughs> I think if Ellen could have gotten Whip to come home with her. <laughs> you are stuck on this, don't you? I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Bob, you answer his question. Yeah, I, 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 I thought about it a lot, and I believe that if, um, if Ellen, uh, Ellen uh, Melissa's character, Ellen Block, hadn't been so, uh, had, had the conviction to, um, you know, in her way, force Whip to tell the one truthful thing that he tells, I think, in the entire movie, um, he probably wouldn't have lived very long. And so I think she actually saved him. Uh, it's time, unfortunately, to wrap this up. First of all, I want to thank uh, the audience here, and I want to thank our five audiences around uh, California. And more important, I'd like to thank the filmmakers and the cast for joining us this evening. Again, I'm sorry that Mr. Washington took ill. Flight is in theaters November 2nd. Have a great evening.